morning everyone hope you can all hear me well um sorry for uh, letting you wait letting you wait a couple of minutes but we were just testing the facilities for this session and we are now uh, ready to start so thank, thanks for joining uh today so uh first of all a uh recap on what is uh this session about so this is about uh, scientific community and the use of EOSCAP and EOSC services. So to provide you some example of uh, successful uh, use cases that uh, you can take as a sample or uh, take as ideas on what you can also do with your research workflows. Um, we will have um, the other chair of this session is Gergely uh, from uh, EGI. I'm, I'm Deborah Pesti from Chineca and we will be chairing this session. Then we, uh, Gergely will give a short introduction on the topic of this session, and we will have four speakers uh, representing four uh, different thematic uh, communities that will uh, give you an overview of what they uh, were able to achieve uh, in using and uh, integrating with the EOS uh, services. Um, as you um, probably already know from other other session uh, you are all muted uh, so um, please uh, if you are we will have uh, question uh, session moments uh, during the session if you have any question you can either write it in the chat and at the right moment i will give you um, the, the word or uh, you can just raise your hands and we will let you uh, unmute you at the, at the right moment so this is with everything from me as just a quick uh, welcome you, uh, and I give the floor to, to Gergely for, for the introduction. Thank you. Um, let me show these few slides. Um, Can you see full screen? The yeah, slide? perfectly yeah, fine. Okay. So thank, thank you very much, Deborah, for the short introduction. So we are running this session together because we are both working with the science communities. And I would like to just briefly explain you how these science communities you will hear about fit into the EOSC Hub project and how they benefit from the EOSC Hub project. You heard about the project overview this morning from Per. And he explained that we work with a large number of scientific communities. Actually, we do work with more than 30 now. And they fit briefly in two main ways into the project consortium. One is the so-called thematic services, which is a dedicated work package. That's what the Bora coordinates, work package seven. And what these thematic service providers do is that in the early months or months of the project, they integrated with different types of federation services that are operated and delivered by other part of EOS Hub. You can see here what these services uh, do. They range from kind of federation capabilities to baseline computing and storage, data management, and, and other software sharing or data sharing uh, management services. The other scientific work package or science community work package is what I coordinate work package eight. It's called competence centers. That's uh, less major in terms of the setup of service delivery. Those competence centers much more focus on the integration of services, trying out services, and testing those services to new users and early adopter users from their communities, and then hopefully push out thematic services as well and deliver those services through the EOS portal. So these science communities, the more developed or more evolved one from day one were selected for the thematic service work package and those that have had less setup or less experience with e-infrastructures and the generic services were put into the competence centers. All of those basically benefit from the project in three ways. One is that they benefit through this integration and then they can receive generic services from the federation and common service stack. 
they can benefit from the training and support which they perform based on the guidances and generic support provided by Work Package 11 in order to reach new audiences. These new audiences can be either production users that can use the thematic services right away or can be early adopter users who test the new setups. And the third way they benefit from the project is through the EOS portal. They actually deliver the ready to use services through the EOS portal and those services are then accessed by the end users. So today we will feature a subset of those communities who we work with in such a way. Here is the complete picture. I think Barry used that slide or th that diagram in two slides in his talk. It shows the complete portfolio of, of competence centers that we have, the complete portfolio of thematic services that we work with. These together are more than 30 communities. Half of those or nearly half of those came in uh, through the early adopter program in 2020. The others started two, two and a half years ago. So today we will have four presentations from four thematic service providers. You can see a range of activities that they did. We will start with Alexander from the structural biology community. Then we will continue with Daniela from a generic service that was originally developed for high energy physics and then it uh, took up usage in other disciplines. Then Fabrizio will talk about uh, uh, an environmental sciences, a climate change service, and Dieter will be a presenter about humanities and social sciences. So we cover basically the four main scientific disciplinary areas, life sciences, physics, uh, environmental sciences, and humanities in this session today. So thank you. That was just a brief introduction to put the session into um, context. Thanks a lot, Gergely. Um, I don't see any question at the moment uh, for you. We, we may, might answer later on if, if there are. So I would simply give the floor to, to Alexander uh, for okay. his presentation. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Okay, so is everything is right. You are seeing my slides now? Yes, perfectly. So, well, good morning, everyone. So I'm Alexandre Bonvin from Utrecht University, and I'm representing today WeNMR, uh, and I'm going to talk about structural biology in the cloud and discuss, say, more than 10 years of experience now using uh, EOS and EGI services over the years. Uh, I saw in the keynote in the plenary that there was questions. So there were questions about chemistry. What is chemistry? Uh, I belong to a chemistry department. So even if this is about biological sciences, we are working, uh, say, at the chemical level. So this is also chemistry. So uh, just a short introduction. So the we and mathematics services uh, are integrated in EOS Hub. Uh, you can find them from the Hub project. You can also find them from the EOS portal, the marketplace. Actually, tomorrow I will be part of the uh, closing plenary and I will give a live demo of accessing uh, those services. So I'm not going to do that uh, uh, today. So they have been in production since more than 10 years now under various European projects. It started with ENMR, a project where we uh, develop our own infrastructure, also the compute infrastructure. Uh, the project involved in WeNMR, where we open the resource to worldwide user. That's what W stands for. And then through several, several projects over the years, you find EGI Engage, Westlife, uh, Indigo Data Cloud. And over the years, we have been piloting uh, actually uh, developments uh, using of new resources uh, that are offered by the infrastructure. So our compute model is an opportunistic compute model. So we are basically filling the gaps uh, in the infrastructure uh, resources, uh, but the, the access to the resources has been formalized uh, in a service level agreement that has been renewed now several times over the years. And the current one is uh, valid until the end of, of this year, which gives us access to about 16 million CPU hours and a number of sites that are committed to support us. So, uh, so we are mainly using uh, high throughput compute resources, so the old grid type of computings. Uh, we don't use much data. 
So users are submitting data that are processed by our portal. And we also have some committed storage, but again, the, it's more about processing of data and computing than about uh, the data, uh, than providing data in that sense. So in terms of resource, just uh, and, and the impact that the project has, um, uh, you can see here. So we have uh, to date, I think, probably today more than 17 and a half thousand registered users so this is uh, this has been going up quite quickly in the in the recent weeks um, since the start of the eos hub project so we're speaking 2018 more than 8,000 new users joined the project we are reaching more than 110 countries so you see the world map which is also accessible directly online the, the url is below um, all aggregated actually so this map again was probably a week old or a few weeks old um, all aggregated actually eu users like at this time have the majority uh, if you put all the countries together and then we have a lot of usage from asia but also the us so we are a global we are serving a global community and uh, this kind of research is global so we cannot put frontiers uh, in what we are doing and this is something that over the years, uh, we also had support from EU, but from EGI and EOS to provide access to users outside the European border. And that's important. Uh, we are submitting, uh, so, so users are submitting job to the portal and we are, so the portal are translating those submission into, uh, into high throughput jobs and uh, in the order of 20 million jobs are submitted to HTC resources, uh, which is more than 36 million CPU hours. Uh, we have several papers that are uh, uh, basically describing the portal or the software behind the portal. Those are highly cited, cited because our portals are also highly used. And we also have a mechanism of uh, measuring uh, user satisfaction. I think an important point about all these thematic services is service needs has to be used. If it's not used, if it has no usage, then it's, it's a useless uh, service and a waste of money. So demonstrating usage is uh, important in my view. Just to show you that, uh, yes, uh, we are being used and we have a sustained use of your services. What you are seeing here is a plot of unique users per month. So we have more than 17,000 users that registered into the service. Of course, they are not all active at the same time. So what you are seeing, is, seeing here is that per month, we have in your, say between 300 and 400 users, unique users that are using the services. And you also uh, see an increase in usage in the last two months. And this is basically a COVID-19 effect. So we have seen increased registration rates to our services because we are providing tools that allow you to actually study the interaction of the virus with uh, human proteins or, or to target drugs to human proteins to try to block the infection. This is the number of uh, submissions that the, those users are doing to the portal. So we had in the order on average of say 300 active users per Months and what, what you see here is that those users on average are submitting each at least 10 jobs to the portal because our average per month is in the order of 3,000 uh, submissions that are processed. And you see here on the right side uh, columns appearing in red. Uh, this is again uh, COVID 19 jobs since we have enabled since uh, uh, April now tagging of the submissions as COVID 19 for researchers that are specifically. Uh, uh, using uh, doing this kind of research this also enables us to basically target the jobs to to resource specific resources that are supporting uh, uh, or computing for covid related projects now how does all this uh, so this is the, the front end um, how do things look under the under the hood we need we need of course the e infrastructure we need to access the eos high throughput compute resources in order to be able to serve our users uh, but you don't only need access to the resource. You also need a complex infrastructure at your site, at the site where you are providing the services to manage uh, user registration, submission, uh, pre-processing, post-processing of data, and present the results to the user, all in a user-friendly uh, way. So our thematic services, so you see here on the... Um, right side uh, a view of the EOS WMR portal as we host them in my lab in, in Utrecht. So they have a common look and feel for the end user. Uh, so web, the user interacts with a web page 
This is the front end of the service exposed to the user, so the user doesn't deal with the complexity of the infrastructure behind the portal. Uh, the back end, what is behind the portal, is, uh, is a variety of software scripts to manage and, and workflows to manage all the computations. In order to distribute efficiently all our compute jobs uh, onto the EOS infrastructure, we make use of the Dirac for EGI service. I'm going to come back shortly uh, uh, to those uh, aspects. We use uh, HTC EGI resources. We also have our own resources. Uh, from time to time, we are diverting jobs from, say, using EOS resource to local resources. Uh, because from time to time, there are small glitches and problems. And from our perspective as service provider, we want the end user to be able to use the service 24 seven, which means that you also need a bit of local resources to catch problem and make things transparent to the end user. Uh, to facilitate registration to the service, we make use of the EGI check-in mechanism as a single sign-on. Uh, some of the portal connect uh, to data uh, solutions like one data. And we're also making use of the Indigo Data Cloud U-Docker solution. Uh, in some cases. So this is the typical uh, architecture that you will find behind the portal. So a user will never see that, but the thematic service provider has to handle all of that and, and make sure that all the components of these workflows are working. So this is a view of the of one of our portal, this is, and so, so you recognize the, say, the same look and feel. This is what the user will see. Uh, once a user submits uh, to the portal, uh, first of all, they will have to log in into the portal. So, so we have to check, is the user properly registered? This login can happen through the EGI SSO. Uh, we'll, you also have to make a lot of validation on what the users are submitting to the portal because you want uh, that uh, to catch errors as soon as possible so that they are not going to waste resources on the EOS uh, infrastructure or cause problems, uh, say, cause data ends in, in your workflow processing. So typically there is, an, uh, there is uh, some processing steps that are done, uh, say behind the portal on the local infrastructure where the portal is hosted. And then we submit jobs to the grid, to the HTC resources using Dirac for AGI. This will be the default mechanism or we submit jobs to our local resources. Um, in this particular example, this VC is making use of uh, GP GPU resources uh, on the grid. Uh, once uh, you have to monitor what's happening to those jobs, you collect back the data, uh, and then you're going to post-process the data to at the end present them as a results page to the user and notify the user that uh, his results are ready. So this is not a question of seconds. Uh, depending on the portal, the computations can take days before the user gets back his results. So we have an email notification system to, to alert the user when things are, are ready. So uh, I already mentioned Dirac for EGI as a mechanism to submit uh, jobs to, to high uh, throughput resources. Uh, for us, it has been uh, working uh, extremely uh, efficiently. So we have implemented it in our portals, in our portals since 2015. So it's in operation uh, for five years now, uh, thanks to the support of Ricardo and uh, Andre, who basically uh, helped us and guided us in this implementation. Now, for those of you who are more into the compute side, uh, there are a lot of advantages of using Dirac for EGI. You don't need root access um, to install it and to run it. Uh, it's self-contained, so it's rather simple to maintain. And you can even transform your own laptop into an HTC server if you have it running, which I also have. So, so the syntax is quite simple. Uh, it also depends very much on what type of computing you are doing. So the, the typical use cases that we as uh, we NMR thematic service provider have are, are rather, uh, these are compute intensive jobs, rather short jobs, but they, they require CPU and we don't have a large data volume. And Dirac is perfectly suited for these kind of scenarios. We send the data through Dirac for AGI and we retrieve the data through Dirac for AGI. Another advantage for us is that uh, Dirac is basically uh, able to handle both HTC compute resource in terms of grid sites, but also cloud resources. And it's completely transparent for us as a thematic service provider, which is a big advantage as well. So we don't have to worry about the cloud thing. So if the grid is disappearing tomorrow and we get a lot of cloud resources, Dirac should be able to handle this for us in a transparent way. 
some of our portal already mentioned are making use of uh, uh, GP GPU resources. You also find a number of those on the EOSC infrastructure. Uh, these are two of the portals that are doing that, and I'm not going to explain you what they are doing. Uh, the only thing I want to mention here is that uh, those portals, the software behind the portals requires quite a number of, of libraries. Uh, so you have complex software dependencies. And this is not something that you can ask the system administrator on the remote side to install for you. So a good solution for this is to actually use Docker containers. Um, but Docker containers historically had, had, had an issue, security issue, or the sites didn't like to to run them because you need to have some root access. Uh, but thanks to a solution that was developed under the Indigo Data Cloud project, uh, we can use UDocker, which is basically a user-based uh, version of Docker, meaning that we can uh, run on the grid using Docker containers. Uh, and this avoids all the software installation trouble on, on the remote side. So this is something that as community we've been piloting in, in a previous uh, EGI Engage project. So now to finish with a few examples, uh, just shortly of what uh, we have been doing recently in terms of thematic services in relation to COVID-19. So one of the portal, the one which is actually the most used is uh, our ad hoc portal, which allows to model interactions between biomolecules. It can be protein, 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 small molecule. So this is by far the most uh, used services uh, out of the WMR offered thematic services. Uh, it can be used in terms of COVID research to model interactions, for example, between the viral and the human proteins or for drug screen purposes. So since several weeks, we have uh, seen an increased number of registrations. So you see here a, a registration curve. So this is just focusing since the beginning of the year. This is, by the way, a logarithmic scale. So it looks linear, but it's still exponential. And you see that the curve goes up since about uh, uh, mid-March. Uh, and this is typically an effect of, of, of the COVID uh, pandemic. So we see a lot of researchers starting to work on this. Um, to respond to this uh, demand, we have also double the processing capability. This was not so much a limitation of the EOS resources, but this was more a limitation of our machinery, the back end of the portal. Uh, so we could double the processing capacity to about 200 uh, docking runs per day. And we also enable uh, tagging of uh, the job submission as COVID related. And this allows us to target those jobs specifically uh, to sites that are supporting us. And since the beginning of the pandemic, for example, through contact between EGI and the US Open Science Grid, we gain access to uh, US HTC resources to run both COVID and, and uh, regular jobs. Also, we had contact through high energy, with high energy physics, again, via EGI. And a number of sites have been uh, providing us resources since now uh, a bit more, more than one month, like the, the Centre de Physique et Particules de Marseille uh, kit in uh, Karlsruhe, where we should have been these days, and also uh, a Spanish uh, high energy physics site. And in direct, thanks to André, we added a mechanism to be able to tag the jobs as COVID and direct those to those resources. This is just a snapshot <coughs> of from uh, the last uh, months, basically, running until the 14th of May. Uh, you see the number of, of jobs that are running on the HTC resources. Uh, the violet colors are COVID tag jobs. And you see peaks. Those peaks are on screening effort, but you see there's a constant uh, fraction of jobs that are now becoming COVID, and this fraction is only increasing. Uh, over the last 30 days, the majority of jobs that run actually were tagged as COVID. And you can see here where they have been running. So the, these are the sites that are providing specifically resources for COVID-related research. A large fraction in the Netherlands. This is Kit in Karlsruhe. You find Marseille and you find the jobs here uh, in the US. So ourselves, we have been doing a screening of about 2,000 existing drug, approved drugs against one of the uh, COVID uh, protein. And we were able to run this by using the EOS HTC resources in about three and a half days, which uh, for ad hoc is a very efficient and fast way of, of, of doing that. So you can read more about those efforts. There have been publication also uh, from EOS Hub, from the Instruct Eric, and, and the results are available at our website. So with that, uh, I want to, to, to finish. I want to acknowledge the support over the years of several European projects, but also of the Dutch Research Council. Uh, and I have to thank the people who are uh, responsible for all uh, 
the operation and making sure that our portals are up to date and constantly developing our software. Uh, Brian and Rodrigo in particular, uh, Panos and Manon for the COVID uh, drug screening. Former group members who have been contributing to the development of our portal. The EGI team for continuous support over 10 years and Andre for his Dirac for EGI uh, commitment to support us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot. Uh, it was a very uh, interesting presentation. So I would uh, first see if there is any uh, question from the audience. Uh, just to let you know that Alexander unfortunately has to leave before uh, the end of the session. So if you have questions specifically for him, uh, this is the, the right moment uh, to, to, to raise your hand uh, and make the question. Uh, I'm also looking to the chat if we have uh, anything for you um, or that we can address now. Just one second. I think Sean's question. Yeah, there is a Sean okay. question for Sean. Sean, would you like to, to, to say it loud? Let me look for you. And I'm mute if I can find it. So the application, yeah. uh, the license software. Yeah, yeah. how do you deal is with the question? So okay. we, as you know, we've been dealing with a similar uh, tool for HPC and cloud resources. Uh, so we have a problem with licensing and trying to get hold of licenses on the cloud. Yeah. So for uh, so Haddock is using a, a computational engine called CNS, um, which is free uh, to use for non-profit research. Uh, so it means that companies, uh, we can not really give access to companies. Well, in principle, we can give access to companies, but the companies cannot do anything with that because they cannot protect their IPs. So the companies that are using our software will be pharma companies. Uh, the other issue here is that they don't want to bring any of their IP and molecules outside their network. Yeah, so this is pharma companies are not. Uh, uh, we also had in the past a MATLAB-based uh, uh, service. Um, and this was possible because at the time there were open libraries for MATLAB. So you will get the running libraries at the time were available. So you could deploy them on the, on the grid, basically. So this was my timer, sorry. You could deploy them on the grid. But for Haddock, we also basically, uh, the registration is, um, is free, but we are checking all registration and we have to approve the registration as well. So we are filtering commercial users, so actually we're making them aware of the limitations. Yeah, it's, I was thinking more about applications that make use of licensed software like IDL or MATLAB. Yeah, so we are trying to, uh, so except for this component which is limited to non-profit, some of the other software are our own software and it's open access. Uh, so you have to use as much as possible open access software if possible, if you want to have a service which is open to everyone. We cannot pay for the licenses to support the community. No. Okay, thanks. And also see a question from Mark Allen to everyone. You know, how do you make sure that the services are sustainable? Uh, in EOS, we're speaking a lot about, you know, getting support for the infrastructure, but you also need manpower to operate those services all the infrastructure that we are running at our local site doesn't run by itself. Uh, there are always some glitches or things that you have to monitor. You need to provide, provide support to users. You have to answer user questions. So you cannot leave a service out there by itself and, and hope that everything goes right. Um, and this is a continuous struggle to make sure that I have people in my lab that can do all the work. I'm working in an academic environment, so I don't have any permanent position associated uh, with me, except my home. And that's very different than our research center. And that's something that I think EOSC should also realize that it's not only putting services out there, but it's also supporting them. And you need to support the people supporting the services. Any other question? Oh, yeah, please. Can I follow up on that? Yeah. Uh, please you know, I, asked, I asked the initial question. Yeah. Um, because behind that, there is a, there's a clear cost in 
uh, uh, you know, organizing and uh, implementing your services in this type of framework. And if it's only done in a kind of project way where a couple of years later it's, you know, you are having to do it again because, uh, because the project you got to fund to, to join EOSC is no longer there. Uh, you know, you have to be very careful. That's why I asked about the sustainability. And uh, so, I, so we run a data center where we do have permanent staff and we do have long-term sustainability, but we still also have to uh, judge the cost of, uh, of implementing based on uh, sustainability. So for us, it's a, a really important question, not just for projects that are for a couple of years, but projects are for like uh, uh, 50 years. So. Yeah. So we've been operating for 10 years now and uh, there were gaps in funding if you look at the EU, say, infrastructure uh, funding. Uh, we kept operating the services. That's also important from an end-user perspective. If you are stopping your services because now you have a gap of six months, you are losing your users and they are not going to come back if you do that too often. So all the software development is a research question on my side and this is funded more by research grants, but the operation requires people and that's always a jungling with the resources that you have and I hope that uh, EOSC uh, will realize that uh, this also needs to be supported if you want to make sure that there is usage of the resources. Tiziana has a question. With a comment, uh, Alexander, if you allow me, I think this question on sustainability has the two angles. One is uh, how the services that you've mentioned in the workflow are sustained, and uh, surely one uh, concern that we see, also concern for years, is how the depletable resources like computing and storage can be funded when you want to support the loosely coupled communities of practice like Rienemar and the the sustainable way to do that is to have uh, programs at national level that ensure funding on a sustained long-term basis to communities that have, don't have a legal entity like IS3 or ERIC. And that means recognize the uh, sustained funding from ministries for that. In EGI, we are able to do this because we have a quite uh, densely distributed the network of data centers and there is a keen interest on the data centers in supporting successful user communities but without uh, more organic funding and long-term funding for this kind of communities it's hard to ensure um, this long-term perspective the other point is uh, how to sustain uh, in terms of uh, operational efforts the adding value services like those presented uh, today by Alexandra and other thematic services. I can give my EGI perspective. We think these are integral parts of the infrastructures and uh, we are moving as EGI to embrace and increase the support in terms of operation training and outreach to these uh, components which are as important as infrastructure in terms of computing and, uh, and storage. And this is a, is a shift, it's an area of excellence in Europe that we should uh, cherish and, uh, and strengthen. Uh, so this is, I'd like to, yeah, this is my EGI, EGI view. And EOSC has an, op it has an opportunity to, to ensure that. I guess in the sake of time, we should move to the next uh, Yeah, I was, go I was going to say the same. Thanks, Alexander, for, for Thank your you. presentation and time. So uh, I think next presenter is Daniele. Daniele? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, you can share oh. your slide. Yeah. Can you see my slide? Perfectly fine, thanks. Okay, thank you. So, good morning everybody. I'm Daniel Espiga from uh, INFN and uh, today I'm talking on behalf of the uh, DOTAS team about the experience that uh, have been achieved uh, in, the, in the recent years uh, um, into uh, two directions in terms of communities and uh, as well as um, infrastructure. So, this is the uh, outline of my, of my talk. Uh, I will try to, to set uh, uh, the common ground about the uh, pillars of the thematic service of DODAS. Uh, sorry, and, Daniele, can you stop a moment? Uh, is there is some um, 
it's like we are seeing other windows from your computer Oops. Uh, popping up. <laughs> uh, so maybe we can just try to show it again. Sorry for that. Give me one sec. Okay. It's flickering between different uh, windows. Oops. Oh, okay, so are you in the outline? Yeah, but oh. it's no. my bad now. But it's, a, it's still flickering. I don't know why. Uh, perhaps it has something to do with the. I think you're presenting via the uh, browser. Is that right? Yeah, you're correct. Is that um, a problem? Maybe it's not as effective. Maybe you can download it as a presentation and then it might work better. Let me see if now it's going to be better. Okay. Anything better? Could, no, I think it's still um, it's still coming through. Um, could you so, try sharing just a specific application? Maybe yeah. that way there won't be interference. So now I have changed. Can you see now? Yes, I think this is. Um, oh, just a second. There still seems to be an issue. Um, I have changed everything, so it should be. <laughs> indeed. Um, Deborah, do you have a copy of the uh, slides? Maybe. You can. Uh, yeah, I have the copy of the slides, so I can try to present it, Daniela. Just one okay. second. Okay. So I'm stop sharing. Yeah, please stop sharing. I will I will present it on your view. Let's see first if you can see it and then oh, okay. Can you see it? Yes. I'm trying to go to full screen. Okay. Okay, can you see it correctly now? Um, it's, not, it's not a full screen mode. Uh, in my... okay. <laughs> it, it is in full screen in my screen, obviously, but just, let me just retry. Maybe I have first to move, go to the full screen <coughs> and start to share. Better now? Yeah, for me yes. it's okay. Okay, sorry for that. Okay, please, so, Daniela, let me know when you. I, I need to, to go to the next slide. Thank you. So next slide, I was saying that um, this is the outline of my talk. Uh, there will be a, a, a very brief introduction uh, uh, setting the ground about, about the data thematic service main pillars. I will uh, move uh, to the um, uh, showing the evolution in terms of the two uh, main uh, main uh, point of view, communities and providers, evolution of DODAS. And so uh, I will uh, um, make a, a walkthrough uh, trying to, to show also the impact that we see on research activities uh, uh, that, that uh, the thematic service had. And finally, I will summarize and try to, to provide some hints uh, about the, uh, the future direction. So next slide, please. <coughs> this is, uh, <coughs> This is uh, uh, in, a, uh, in briefly uh, the uh, the main uh, the main messages uh, that I want to share about the thematic service. So first of all, that DODAS stands for uh, Dynamic On Demand Analysis Service, uh, and since the beginning, uh, uh, 
uh, it has been designed in order to uh, provide uh, um, the possibility to create and provision infrastructure deployments uh, uh, in an automatically and repeatedly way, um, trying to, to tend to the uh, uh, zero effort uh, uh, model. What does it mean in practice? Uh, uh, it's shown in the uh, four bullets that you see on top on the, <coughs> on the right, the way what you see that uh, um, we uh, us try to, to, in, to implement the, the resource abstraction, the automation, uh, the support of multi-cloud, uh, and of course, uh, the, the integration with the federated authentication model. All, the, all these kind of uh, uh, pillars uh, have been implemented also using the um, common solution coming from the EOS CAB um, uh, portfolio. So uh, going further, uh, the, um, uh, the paradigm that implement uh, uh, DODAS is based on the infrastructure as a code. Uh, this means that uh, if we want to cut a long story uh, short, uh, we, uh, we are fully convinced that we need to focus on what is important to deploy on the e infrastructure instead of how to deploy uh, um, services and infrastructure itself, computing infrastructure itself. So what does it mean uh, uh, this uh, um, is that uh, actually we want to let the underlying system to, ab to abstract uh, everything, uh, quote unquote, for the, for the end user and uh, um, uh, let him to, to work under, under the hood to make uh, uh, the complex uh, uh, the complex stuff uh, for the user itself so <clears throat> if we want uh, we can say that dodas in the end allow to instantiate on demand container container based uh, cluster everywhere everywhere and when I say uh, container-based cluster, I mean uh, a set of uh, um, a broad set of uh, uh, services that uh, that can be uh, can be summarized as uh, things get, that that goes from big data um, uh, pre-processing and post-processing platform up to the uh, most canonical best system as a service, uh, possibly federated uh, uh, in a distributed e infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So this is, uh, uh, this is about uh, um, um, the, uh, the summary of the key information, again, uh, about DODAS, uh, about DODAS uh, from uh, um, another perspective. So in the, uh, in the um, box on the right, you see uh, uh, how DODAS is, uh, uh, is uh, designed to be uh, a Lego blocks uh, platform uh, which can be uh, can be customized um, in order to accommodate needs uh, from diverse communities, uh, and uh, you also see from there that uh, uh, it has been built uh, on top of uh, the modern industry standards so in order to benefit of uh, the evolution that we have also uh, uh, around us. The glue of all of these uh, are. Uh, most of the uh, common services that we uh, integrate uh, um, in the, uh, uh, from the, uh, from the uh, portfolio that we have in the, um, the um, EOSCAR project. So in terms of users, DODA targets uh, both uh, researchers, uh, single researchers or very small group of researchers um, uh, that may have also requirement-specific workflows uh, uh, which uh, end up in uh, uh, requirement-specific uh, from the uh, infrastructure point of view, let's think about uh, uh, specialized hardware access, uh, GPU, uh, uh, fast uh, storage, uh, quality of service, all these kind of things. Um, but also uh, target uh, big communities uh, because in the end it boards uh, within a big community, I will tell about this. Uh, small groups of, of, of uh, researcher or small, uh, small communities. And uh, finally, also uh, <coughs> resource providers are um, a user of DODAS. Uh, indeed, <laughs> you may choose to provide your resources through, through these uh, uh, the kind of technologies and services. Next slide, please. So <coughs> um, this, uh, this is a summary of the evolution as I uh, in Introduced uh, of the of the project. Uh, it starts on uh, 2017 within the uh, uh, Indigo Data Cloud project um, to in order to integrate uh, uh, the first uh, uh, the first uh, workflows uh, from the uh, CMS experiment, the, com <coughs> the uh, compact move and solenoid, solenoid experiment at CERN. Uh, since then, uh, there was a uh, uh, quite interesting evolution and consolidation of the system that uh, uh, also um, uh, have been helped by the um, uh, 
uh, intense exploitation plan that started uh, started uh, uh, with uh, um, with Hioska project when Dodas become uh, a thematic service uh, uh, of the project itself. You see, uh, there are references in this timeline uh, both to the um, uh, to the uh, communities that uh, along the time uh, started integrating and using Dodas. You see, uh, in 2018, uh, the, the first uh, and the most important one was the um, uh, AMS, uh, and I will be back to this, uh, um, that started to be integrated and now, nowadays is in production. Uh, the, the here later, we, uh, we started the integration, still work in progress uh, uh, of the um, gravitational wave experiment in particular Virgo, and the most uh, uh, recent success uh, from from my perspective, is integration of uh, the Fermi LAT experiment that, that is uh, uh, running already uh, a first official anal data analysis that will be published very soon. And uh, in terms of, uh, term of resources, uh, uh, you see that uh, most of the commercial clouds have been integrated in, along the here, but I want to point the attention, uh, as I will detail in the, next, uh, in the next part of the talk, uh, that in the, uh, toward the end of 2019, uh, we have also uh, performed a successful uh, um, proof of concept integrating the AGI federated cloud. There are finally uh, strong synergy that have been established and are in, the, uh, in, the, in progress since uh, uh, the, the, the recent months uh, um, with the ESK project and uh, uh, WLCTG. I will conclude with information about that. So next slide, please. This is, uh, um, uh, there are now a couple of information and I, I don't want to put, uh, to, to give you details, of course, uh, uh, but uh, this is to show a um, couple of uh, interesting example of uh, researcher specific activities. So research that has a requirement specific workflow that need to run on these uh, on uh, infrastructure. So, and generally speaking, on a, as um, having specific requirements in terms of uh, um, uh, hardware and uh, configuration. On the left, the, the, this is an example of Imperial Co College of London that decided to, to use DODAS in order to cope with the production and the generation of specific events uh, uh, in the scope of CMS, uh, the, the CMS experiment, uh, and this uh, happened uh, more or less uh, uh, toward the end of 2018. And in the same period, uh, also the uh, data preservation and open access group uh, uh, exploit DODAS in order to combine it with the Rihanna project uh, with the goal of provisioning open uh, legacy data uh, also to people coming uh, outside of the experiment uh, in order to, to, to process uh, and to access uh, uh, this kind of uh, open data. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another example referring to the uh, very, 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 very recent activity done, done uh, by the uh, alpha magnetic spectro spectrometer uh, analyst. And uh, uh, the key message here is uh, what is uh, highlighted in blue color. As you see, that there are two analyses that at the moment, uh, uh, in 2020, this is the very recent activities. I may have mentioned uh, what happened in the, the, the past, but I think focusing on the recent uh, is uh, more interesting. So there are two analyses that will be updated with the more statistics and the more information that the experiment collected, and uh, both of them that will be uh, carried on using the, uh, the resources provided uh, through the uh, uh, exploiting some um, uh, uh, some facility that I will uh, I will show <coughs> in the next slide. So moving ahead, please. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the final example that I would uh, provide in terms of support and impact on communities. This is the Fermilat uh, uh, analysis uh, done using the others. So, so we may summarize uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, all this information in saying that, that uh, uh, what uh, um, the researcher the, the researcher um, stated after uh, uh, having a try and uh, uh, integrating the workflow on, on DOTAS provider resources. Uh, and uh, uh, she, t she told us uh, that's very promising uh, and uh, we need uh, this kind of solution. Indeed, uh, they are using high throughput computing as most of uh, uh, the community that I'm, I'm showing today. And uh, uh, they have a, 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 repeat, a repeated step uh, kind of analysis, uh, and they need uh, um, and they need a solution. And they, they, need, they need to scale uh, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, computing power as much as they can. And uh, what I did uh, uh, is actually to port all the software that they had uh, they had in a DOTAS compliant environment, which in the end means uh, HT Condor for them. Uh, so something pretty standard and easy. 
quote unquote. And uh, what they did uh, in the re very recent months uh, uh, is to, to, to run over uh, 60K, um, <coughs> 60K uh, analysis jobs. Uh, uh, and what they have in mind, uh, what in, in, in the pipeline, sorry, is to run uh, a few more, few more uh, detection uh, and uh, which translate in, uh, in uh, in few uh, few um, uh, million of jobs that they need to run. So <clears throat> uh, the, the analysis produced with this infrastructure that, that will be uh, that we, uh, it will be published uh, very soon. So next slide, please. Uh, now I I move toward the uh, the conclusion of this uh, uh, the second part of this uh, talk, and this is about uh, the uh, impact uh, and the experience that we did integrating resources. I'm not gonna mentioning uh, all the integration and uh, the, the um, uh, that have been happened in the past year with the commercial cloud and other private infrastructure, but I want to mention to the most recent one because it's kind of interesting and news new in terms of uh, uh, specific uh, specific integration that we have carried on in this respect, and this is uh, <clears throat> about the integration with the AGI Federated Cloud. As you see, the AGI the, the Federated Cloud is providing the infrastructure as a service federation layer. Layer on top of which, uh, the, thanks to Dota's deployer, we have put in place an overlay uh, based on Condor. The, the, the schema here uh, uh, represents from 10 kilometers far what, uh, what are the layers and who, what, who is doing what. And uh, as you can see, we involved uh, five sites uh, providing clouds uh, and points in the end, and uh, um, we, we implemented the overlay. The overlay means that in the end, uh, you see a single, a single site. A single entity, which is uh, what uh, both uh, typically both researchers, but also big community like to see. So the, the less the granularity is uh, uh, is uh, um, in the end of in the end of the uh, user or community, the better is for the uh, for the front end. Let me say. And uh, what's happened in this uh, uh, in this uh, proof of concept is shown in the next slide. So please uh, uh, go uh, to the next one, and is rep represented here. So if you see the plot on the top. Uh, on the top left, uh, this is uh, <clears throat> taken from the uh, official infra uh, monitoring uh, infrastructure for the CMS experiment. We use the CMS to benchmark the integration that I just shown uh, uh, to, uh, between DODAS and the GI Federated Cloud. And uh, uh, the, the information that you can get out of this um, plot is that uh, uh, you had, uh, uh, we had uh, um, more or less uh, uh, 400 continuously running jobs uh, um, uh, during the test. There are several steps uh, that highlighted by the uh, white arrow in the plot. Uh, the steps are the site that the under the hood join the uh, DODAS Federation, <clears throat> but then are uh, hidden uh, to the experiment. The experiment just seen more resources, and, and so a step ahead, a peak uh, appear in the uh, amount of resources that are, are, are joining the system. Uh, uh, but uh, as I said, in the end, uh, the, the system just see uh, one uh, one side, so one endpoint where to submit jobs. If we want to translate like this, in the uh, plot on the on the right. <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, in the plot on the right, uh, there is the uh, the very same uh, the very same kind of information taken from the. AGI accounting information, and if you want to, uh, if we want to, to to have a fun, you can see that there is a, a correlation between the peak that you see on the plot on the first plot that I described and the second one, a part of the spike. And you see that uh, sites are uh, joining and peaks on the system of CMS experiment is seen uh, as useful slot where to run jobs. Finally, the pie chart show you the uh, uh, virtual site generated uh, with others on top of the AGI federated cloud with respect to the uh, other three or three um, belonging to CMS. The bigger one is uh, uh, the Fermilab one uh, and the second one in terms of sites during the exercise that we did, uh, it was that one that I'm describing. So let's move to the um, to the uh, the final uh, the final information that I want to share in terms of DODAS and providers. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, so DODAS has uh, um, the capability to 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 manage stateless uh, stateless uh, resource provider. What does it mean? So this is a concrete example. We have the space uh, uh, scientific data uh, center. Uh, the, uh, at the Italian Space Agency, the ACI, uh, and uh, um, that is hosting uh, resources for the uh, AMS collaboration. 
Uh, and uh, in, mm, the, the key point is that there is no experiment dedicated in manpower in the uh, SSD uh, DC center, and there is no specific expertise on AMS software and computing uh, as well. So there is no one that can help there, but there is just a bare metal running, uh, uh, running uh, uh, an operating systems there. So what uh, we did uh, and what is in production now is the integration, the transparent integration of these resources in a, a Doda, fashion, uh, Doda fashion. So <clears throat> uh, this is a concrete example of a stateless provider. So a, pro a provider that has a computing power but no manpower to support a specific activity. What we did, was to extend uh, the official and the pledged uh, uh, batch system of, the, of uh, uh, AMS, uh, including the, uh, the resources that I'm talking, uh, talking about. Moreover, we did a, a further integration using the uh, thematic service uh, resources that uh, belong to the project, uh, uh, the Heoscap project uh, that are running at CNAF in this specific example, and we further extended to, to with others uh, to uh, another uh, stateless site, which is running uh, uh, virtually at um, uh, INFN CNAF. And you see that um, uh, by magic, uh, jobs uh, started running everywhere, uh, and uh, in a completely uh, transparent manner for the end user. So what you can uh, learn from here is that we have handles and we have uh, uh, tools and competencies in order to benefit of any kind of resources that we can uh, get uh, in order to help researcher and uh, even resource provider. So um, moving to the next uh, slide, uh, there is the uh, final part of my talk uh, that is focusing on proof of concept activity that we are doing uh, and we are moving to a slightly different domain with what we just uh, uh, I, ju I have just explained. So sorry, a step back uh, the slide, the previous slide, slide number twelve. So this is uh, um, uh, the usage of uh, uh, the usage of Dodas, an example of usage of Dodas uh, as a decision service, means uh, a smart service for implementing smart caching. I'm not gonna discussing what what is a cache or what is a smart cache, but you think something like. Uh, uh, um, a bot uh, with, uh, which help, uh, which help uh, uh, the cache, uh, a cache system in order to understand if a file is worth to be kept or not uh, within the disk or within the memory of the cache itself. <coughs> and uh, uh, we have implemented it and we are, we are, um, we are in the process of developing, uh, uh, developing the uh, engine of the system <coughs> And everything is running thanks to Dodas. So there is a TensorFlow as a service uh, uh, platform which is uh, uh, completely embedded in Dodas. This can uh, can be used as an in, uh, as an inference system that uh, is used by the cache. But if you think uh, uh, this as a generic system, uh, it may be coupled to to anything which is. Uh, uh, which is requiring uh, uh, inference uh, scaling uh, uh, scaling approach uh, uh, for inference uh, um, uh, decision. So if you move to the to the next one, <clears throat> the, the very the very final one, th this is uh, another proof of concept which is uh, going on thanks to the synergy that I was mentioning uh, at the beginning uh, with project like Escape, but also with the uh, um, uh, uh, data organization management management access working group in the context of the WLCG, and uh, <clears throat> it's about uh, uh, implementing a real analysis facility which is uh, capable to uh, integrate a federated and distributed federated system of uh, uh, data following the uh, data lake models that is being uh, uh, tested and exploited uh, in the context of, in the context in, in several contexts but for sure in the context of WCG in this case and if we want to give it a name uh, we are uh, we are uh, um, building proof of concept in order to use the, the technology that I have shown today and so what is uh, implemented by the, the thematic service of Dodas in terms of building a computing center with cache and computing center without cache just data from remote streaming from data lakes and uh, <clears throat> the, the key uh, uh, key technical uh, key technical point here is that everything is gonna be uh, integrated uh, using the uh, uh, token based and capability based authentication and authorization model uh, and this is done uh, using the uh, indigo identity uh, access management so uh, uh, concluding my uh, summary uh, slides Next slide, please. So Dodas is a high uh, modular deployer manager, which is built on the concept of infrastructure as a code. 
And uh, the key point is that uh, uh, it has been designed in order to, to implement the possibility to automatically and repeatedly, repeatedly build and create infrastructure for uh, data uh, analysis um, and uh, processing uh, uh, activities for the, um, for the uh, scientific community. So it is evolving uh, and consolidating over time uh, and the evolution uh, um, uh, happen in terms of use cases, uh, in terms of technologies that have been uh, integrated and uh, made uh, available for, to the community, but also in terms of scientific community that, that are uh, uh, joining uh, uh, the project. So we have, a, uh, I think, a well-established R&D uh, program and integration program head, uh, and the two key pillars are the big data platform and the computing uh, uh, in the data lake uh, uh, landscape. And uh, uh, I think we have uh, got very interesting results uh, uh, for communities that uh, um, have been integrated so far. And the, the new recent activities, I think uh, they are setting the ground for promoting the adoption uh, in, the, in, the close, uh, in the close future, the adoption for, uh, in terms of communities, I mean, and, uh, and research. And uh, that's it. So uh, thanks for your attention and questions. Uh -huh. Thanks to you, uh, Daniela. So we are running a little bit, not too much late, but we can take uh, one or two questions if uh, there is anyone from the attendees that would like to ask a question to you. Please just raise your hand. No question for the moment, it seems for you, Daniel. Okay, thank you. Oh, no, yeah, we are one. Stay there. Yeah, I was just a, a very general question about what do you see as the core part of EOS Hub that helps you uh, uh, make this, uh, make Dodas work? Sorry, I missed the, the first part. What about, about the EOS? So what, what is the... the... What is it? How, do, how does EOSC help you do, do this? Well, in terms of, in term of, uh, in term of uh, uh, so I think uh, the, the, the two main, the two main, uh, the two main things that uh, EOSC, uh, EOSC Hub in particular helped and so, so this is, uh, um, this is uh, something that we need to, to consider as a lesson learned is, is the, uh, the possibility to, to implement uh, an exploitation plan that helped and the dissemination plan that helped has uh, in order to, to, to get in contact with communities. And getting, getting in contact with communities helped, helped um, a lot in terms of uh, uh, defining the uh, roadmap and the guidelines uh, in order to, to perform uh, the proper integration of services and to set priorities. So uh, that's one. And the second one is the fact that uh, uh, having a, a, common, <clears throat> a common set of uh, uh, services uh, instead of uh, uh, duplicating the wheel and uh, having people, uh, having services uh, uh, re-implementing something already existing uh, is uh, uh, one of the uh, big benefits that we can have uh, uh, in, uh, in this context. So thank you, Daniela. I think we can move to, to the next speaker for the moment. Um, Fabrizio? Yes, can I share my screen? Yeah, please. Okay, I have a message, host disabled attend screen sharing. I haven't disabled anything, Rob. Have you disabled something? Um, I have okay, maybe now I am a cost yeah. now, so, Please. okay. Can I see my screen now? Perfectly, thanks. Okay. okay, good morning everybody. My name is Fabrizio Antonio from the Advanced Scientific Computing Division of the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change in Lecce. And in this presentation, I give you an overview of ICAS, a Data Science Environment for Climate Change. 
and its main features and how ECAS has been integrated in the EGI infrastructure. ECAS is one of the USCAP thematic services as well as a compute service in the ECNES project. It enables scientific end users to perform data analytic experiments on large volumes of multidimensional data by exploiting PID enabled, server side, and parallel approach. Looking uh, at the architecture on the right, uh, we can see that ECAS consists of multiple integrated components from uh, Indico Data Cloud, like uh, AIM as uh, authentication and, aut and authorization infrastructure solution to to check the user credentials with respect to um, IAM service, as well from UDA, ESGF, and uh, EGI, all centered uh, around the OFIA High Performance Data Analytics Framework, which uh, provides a paradigm shift from sequential and client-based scientific workflow to parallel and server-side data analysis. ECAS Lab is a scientific data analytics environment built on top of ECAS, which integrates data and analysis tools to support data scientists in their daily research activities. In particular, it consists of several components, like an ECAS cluster hosting an instance of the, of the OPIA framework, a Jupyter Hub instance jointly with a large set of frames. Uh, installed Python libraries for running data manipulation, analysis, and visualization, and a monitoring system based on Grafana. The environment also provides access to some datasets by using Threads data server and a number of example Jupyter notebooks and real-world workflow describing indicators from several use cases. Currently, there are too many instances hosted by CMCC and DKZ. The Ophidia Big Data Analytics Framework is the core component of ECAS. It is a complete open source solution used to perform scientific data analytics by means of high-performance computing paradigms and in-memory-based big data approaches in multiple science domains, such as climate change, astrophysics, and so on. It provides parallel server-side data analysis, an internal storage model to manage multidimensional dataset as well as a hierarchical data organization to manage large volumes of scientific data. The features of the OFIDA framework can be directly exploited in the notebooks to run data analytics tests on big datasets and plot the results on charts and maps using well-known Python libraries. This thanks to PyOfidia the OFIDIA Python bindings that allow an easy integration of the OFIDIA operators and workflow into more articulated and shareable data science applications. ECAS has been integrated with OneData in order to provide to any ECAS user a read-only access to the data repository hosted in a OneData space, allowing any analysis on this shared data. In such a context, a one provider service has been deployed at the CMCC Supercomputing Center and attached to the ECAS cluster to reduce networking latencies with respect to the access to remote external providers. To comply with security policies in a data center environment, a single wide client instance has been set up to interact with the provider and the data folders have been mounted on the ECAS user's own through NFS in read-only mode. In this way, the data provider is well isolated from the ECAS resources and communication with the other one data services occurs through the one data protocol. The integration of ECAS into the EGI Fed Cloud has been addressed by, consider by considering two different scenarios. For experts related to software setup and contextualization, both of them rely on the Ophidia Ansible role, which has been extended to include the whole ECAS environment services. In the first scenario, an ECAS single instance virtual machine image providing a ready to use in ECAS environment has been created and uploaded to the EGI AppDB. The virtual machine image has been assigned to a set of trusted virtual organizations in order to be deployed on the third cloud. Through the EGI AppDP dashboard, a user can deploy 
point a pre-built VMI, get the public key address of the running virtual machine, and download the SSH public key to us. The second scenario refers to a multi-nodic environment, which can be dynamically provisioned on the third cloud through the EC3 LTOS service according to the user requirements and without worrying about the complexity of the underlying infrastructure. The EC3 service will, will, will take care of automatically installing and configuring the whole EGAS environment stack, including, as said before, services and tools such as JupyterArt, PyOpedia, a rich set of data science Python libraries, the Ophelia framework, as well as a comprehensive set of Jupyter notebooks from training. Moreover, through an Ansible receipt, EC3 can elastically scale up and down the ECAS cluster size according to the current user workload. In this scenario, a RADOL file has been used for the infrastructure manager to define the cluster setup in terms of resources, infrastructure and software configuration, and contextualization. To configure and deploy a virtual elastic cluster using EC3, we can access the EC3 platform front page and follow a wizard which guides the user during the cluster configuration process. So we can uh, choose ECAS from the list of local resource management system that can be automatically installed by EC3, the endpoint of the provider, the cluster operating system, the instance details in terms of CPU and RAM to allocate for the front-end and the working nodes, and the name of the cluster, the maximum number of nodes without including the front-end. After a summary of the chosen cluster configuration, we can start the deployment, uh, and after a few minutes, when the front-end node of the cluster has been successfully deployed, we can download the SSH private key provided by the C3 portal and access the front-end node via SSH. Both the front-end and working nodes are configured by Ansible. This process usually takes uh, some time, and we can monitor the status of the cluster configuration by using the is cluster ready command line tool, which returns the cluster config message when the cluster is successfully configured. ECAS Lab allows users to get access to its scientific ecosystem through the Jupyter Hub interface. We can log into the system using the username and password specified in the Jupyter Hive configuration file. In particular, in the Ansible role, we created for testing a whitelist of users and we set a global password using the dummy identificator class. So we can access the Jupyter Hive interface using the cluster AP and the 443 port. From Jupyter Hub, in ECAS Lab, we can do several things, such as create and run a Jupyter notebook exploiting PyOfield and Python libraries for, for visualization and plotting, execute operators and workflow directly from the FIDA terminal and browse directly to download upload files in the home folder. Now, starting from one of the Jupyter notebooks uh, provided for training, I would like to show you some basic operations we can perform with Ophelia through uh, its Python interface by Ophelia and how we can easily plot and visualize the results. First of all, we need to import the corresponding modules and connect to the server using the default connection parameters defined in the ECAS environment. We can now create a data cube by importing the NetCDF file previously uploaded. And here, the main important parameters are the source path, of course, the measure name, the implicit dimension time in order to arrange data as a time series, and the IO server type. In this case, we are using the native in memory system, the Ophelia IO server, to run and perform data analytics tests in memory. We can check the data cube using the PyOphilia list method, which is a wrapper to the OPH list of the operator, operator. Now, skipping some cells, we perform a subset operation on the importing data cube using a filter on dimension value. We can then perform a reduction operation by computing the maximum value over the time series for each point in the special domain. And the last step before plotting the results consists in a roll-up operation to reorganize the data structure. And uh, these are the data cubes produced so far. We can now export data in a Python-friendly data structure and use it to create a map. If we want to go consider the whole special domain and specify a particular time point, we don't need to re-import the NetCDF file, but we can use the first imported cube object 
perform the subset operation. Then the reduce and the roll up operations. And finally, we can export the results to create a new map. And at the same way, if we are interested in the minimum value, we can apply the last operation to the subset data view without the need to reimport or subset the data set again. When we are done, we can clean our workspace by deleting all the generated data views as well the container used to organize them. As anticipated before, we can also execute operators directly from the FIDA terminal. In this case, we can simply open a new terminal and using the default parameters defined in the environment, run the OPHTEL command. As an example, we can create a new container using the CC alias and then create a random data cube using the RC alias and providing the dimension size for latitude, longitude, and time dimensions. We can then check the data cubes available in the virtual file system by using the LL alias for the OPH list operator. ECAS also includes an accounting system in order to properly track resource usage on a user basis. In particular, starting from the information tracked by the OFIDA server about workflows and uh, jobs, a set of accounting metrics has been identified to extract useful statistics about users and computing resource usage. For example, until now, 180 users joined ECAS from 23 different countries and uh, about 2 million jobs were run for a total of 10,000 per hour. To conclude, thanks to the EC3 platform, researchers can easily deploy on demand a full ECAS cluster on the AGI infrastructure and perform their data analysis experiments exploiting a server side and parallel approach, as well as visualize the results using the wide set of integrating Python libraries. Next steps regard the integration of the EGI check-in service into ECAS in order to allow user login through the federated authentication mechanism, and this task is actually ongoing. Moreover, we are exploring the one data features for a stronger integration in terms of metadata management, data access using the one data first Python library in addition to the POSIX virtual file system, as well the integration with Jupyter Notebooks via the OneDataFest Jupyter plugin. And uh, here, some useful links uh, about EcasLab, Ophiga, and PyOphiga. Just one more thing, um, we would like to also thank the EC3 at UPV and the EGI and OneData teams for their previous support. Thank you all for the, the attention. Thank you, thank you very much for, for the presentation. So we have a question by Sean, but we will make it at the end after uh, digital presentation because it is uh, addressing all speakers. Is there any specific question uh, for uh, this presenter now? Or we can move uh, quickly to, uh, to Dieter and keep the question for the end. Okay. Okay, Peter. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very you. much, uh, Deborah. Uh, I will start the video here and share my screen. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. Just a second. There we are. And now sharing the screen. Uh, ta -ta -ta. Desktop one. That should do it. Okay. Um, Perfectly fine, can Peter. You see everything? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Dieter van Edvang from uh, Claire and Eric. I'm the technical director there. And uh, today I will try to give you an overview of uh, what we have been doing um, in EOS Cup uh, from uh, our, um, yeah, uh, work package. Uh, and uh, the title is From Hub to Impact for Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, I'll try to give you an overview of how the results look like for, um, say, average uh, end user from the humanities and social sciences. So I will not um, um, give a complete technical overview of everything that has been done. 
uh, if you have questions on that, I would be glad also to take them or to uh, refer you to relevant uh, information on that. Um, okay, so um, what is Claren? Um, Claren stands for Common Language Resources and Technology Infrastructure. Um, and we are um, a research infrastructure uh, serving the humanities and social sciences with um, digital language data and tools to process the data. Um, this goes very broadly, so you can think of uh, written, uh, written language data, uh, spoken uh, recordings, video recordings, multimodal capturings of all kinds of language exchange change in different sizes also. So this goes from, uh, say, a single poem up to huge digital collections of, uh, of videos uh, of people interacting, for instance. Um, together with the data also come the tools to um, uh, discover uh, the data sets, to explore them, uh, uh, use them, annotate them, analyze them, combine all these data sets uh, wherever these are located. So we, it, it's important to mention here that we are um, uh, distributed uh, virtual infrastructure. So we don't have one big installation where everything is running, but we exist out of a network of so-called uh, uh, centers. Um, we are S3 Eric since 2012 and in 2016, Claire and Eric became uh, uh, so-called landmark um, and it'd be good to add uh, to the fact that we are providing access to the data and to the tools in an online way is the fact that specifically for language data there is often a lot of data that is not openly available due to privacy concerns or uh, copyright uh, legislation in such cases we still would like to have give access to people in an as easy as possible way so through a single sign-on i'll come back later to that in the demonstration i uh, will be giving um, who is powering Clarin? Um, well, 95% uh, of the things that I will be showing today is really uh, realized by our national consortia. So we have uh, 24 uh, members and uh, observers. Uh, these exist uh, mostly in the European countries. Uh, we have also uh, uh, concerned a consortium uh, since, since recently in South Africa. Um, and these are providing access to the language data, to the tools through their uh, national uh, organization, so to say, and the centers inside these uh, national uh, consortia. Um, good, that brings me to the, the content of the presentation. Um, and I'll try to give uh, kind of an example today uh, by, by very concrete, um, uh, case uh, where um, a historian is doing research on the uh, on the concept of mental health policy see in the 19th uh, century and this researcher is basically uh, trying to um, do the research in two steps there's a first stage uh, in searching for relevant uh, material and then uh, evaluating the content quickly using so-called uh, distant reading methodology you know Come back to that later about what it exactly is but the the uh, substance is basically quickly grasping through a large amount of uh, textual data to understand what is in there and then later on in the second stage uh, the researcher will uh, uh, be uh, further preparing the data so this this uh, further uh, analysis and enriching of the data uh, for, for further analysis. And this is typically something that is done uh, as, as a research group or uh, that is assisted by a research uh, assistant. Um, and then in the next step, uh, the data will be uh, analyzed uh, linguistically. Uh, for instance, uh, by analyzing the syntactic relations that exist between the um, parts of sentences uh, to answer a specific research question. And just an example here could be uh, to find all objects for the verb to treat. Uh, and obviously this requires a syntactic analysis. And this is where the uh, infrastructure uh, basically uh, comes, uh, comes in. Um, short overview of uh, our so-called uh, thematic services that we have been integrating into uh, EOSC and uh, in, with the other EOSC uh, hub uh, services. Uh, first of all, we have the Virtual Language Observatory, which is a catalog for uh, metadata, uh, so which allows you to quickly search and identify relevant uh, data sets. Uh, then we have here the Virtual Collection Registry, which is a kind of uh, digital bookmark tool which allows you to collect links to uh, data sets uh, at different locations or at 
uh, more uh, similar locations and then publish it as it's a kind of metadata set so in that sense uh, people later on can also uh, find the exact data that you have been using um, and they can also then use it later on for machine uh, processability and uh, finally there's also uh, our language resource switchboard which is a kind of tool that allows you to make a match between an incoming data set and a processing tool so uh, you throw uh, a novel to it and it will give you all kind of tools that are suitable to process the language that is contained inside that uh, digital um, novel um, as said i mean this is very much from a user perspective so behind these services we have a full uh, metadata infrastructure running which again comes with lots of services i will not bother you today too much about this but if you're interested you can find more information about this on the on the website um good um so of course these services are not standing on their own they are um, integrated and this i think is an important part of what i want to convey today is the fact that um uh, from these pre-existing services, we've gone through a deeper and deeper integration, uh, both with within the already existing Clarion ecosystem, but also outside. So with the e-infrastructures, with neighboring communities, and it's a very important part. It really um, yeah, focuses a bit on, on this hub functionality yeah, of uh, the, putting the hub in the, in EOS hub, so to say. Uh, so what are these connections? Well, first of all, we uh, have uh, searchable metadata being uh, sent from, say, for instance, virtual collections to the virtual language observatory so you can search it uh, but also uh, by making data actionable so metadata records that are registered in the virtual language observatory or in the virtual collection registry can also be sent through the switchboard for processing this might sound a bit abstract i hope to make it more concrete in a few seconds when i uh, switch to a practical uh, demonstration um, good, so as I said, we have uh, integrated the Clarin infrastructural components. Now, of course, we've also looked into integrating this further with the uh, e-infrastructure uh, services. And uh, more concretely, we've done this by uh, importing metadata from uh, EU.S. B2Share uh, repository into the Virtual Language Observatory, specifically the subsection that is relevant for uh, language data and humanities. And in a similar way, we've also developed, uh, in collaboration with the uh, EUDA team, uh, a plugin for uh, B2Drop, which allows you to make uh, data that you have uploaded into your own workspace actionable by sending it through the language resource switchboard. Again, I will demonstrate this uh, in, uh, in a few uh, seconds. Um, Going further, so beyond the uh, e-infrastructure uh, scene, we've also um, added um, additional sources of relevant metadata to the virtual language observatory for, in, for instance from our colleagues from uh, Europeana uh, which are providing lots of data and metadata uh, coming from the cultural heritage sector having lots of uh, digital uh, books and uh, other relevant uh, data sets available these are now also findable through the virtual language observatory and um, on the other side here at the uh, switchboard uh, corner, so to say, we've also integrated some external services to process the data. For instance, uh, Voyant, a very popular tool uh, in digital humanities to uh, do this kind of uh, distant reading on uh, material. And the nice thing here of this picture is that this means that you now can, uh, say, process data coming from Europeana with, for instance, uh, Voyant. So all these arrows that are here really mean uh, there's a connection and it's not only just a kind of a theoretical connection. No, you, it means that it makes the data and the metadata actionable all the way through the network. And that's what I will be uh, presenting in uh, the upcoming demonstration. It will exist out of two stages. So first of all, we will be searching in Virtual Language Observatory for uh, relevant texts. We'll perform then a distant reading uh, through uh, calling the switchboard. And then in the second stage, uh, we will uh, take a file that has been collaboratively edited um, and also, again, uh, send that off to um, from B2Drop to specific uh, linguistic analysis uh, chain and look at the outcome. Okay, so let me switch to uh, my browser. Um, okay, so we have found the virtual language observatory in the uh, EOSC uh, portal and we'll now go to the service uh, by clicking here. And this will present us with uh, virtual language 
which observatory uh, we said that we were a researcher interested in the concept of mental health so we will be searching for this and uh, this means that we will be performing a search in about a million metadata records as you can see there are 18 relevant results here uh, with the facet browser we can further or more um, say narrow down the search results in this case uh, we've selected those records in uh, so-called uh, reached us uh, library which is actually the kind of the parliamentary library of um, of Ireland and for instance uh, we can have a look at some specific record that is in there uh, on uh, so-called uh, lunacy uh, law which is a term that was uh, used a lot at the time for referring to uh, mental health issues and this is really um, uh, quite um, uh, useful because from here on we can get access uh, to the actual uh, data so we can uh, click on on this uh, uh, icon and then we get to see um, the uh, resource that is downloaded from the library and indeed you can see here that this is a, a digital book a book that has been scanned and it's also been OCR so we have access to the textual material here now as we said we were interested in basically uh, doing uh, distant reading uh, based on this file so we can now call uh, click on the three dots here and click on process with the language resource switchboard which will um, open up the switchboard as mentioned and now what this um, kind of small in-between tool actually does is it matches the data with uh, tools that can process it so it has automatically find out that this is a pdf file that it's containing english language and it now allows us to uh, basically see all the tasks that we can perform on this specific file as said we were interested in distant reading so we can uh, see some more information here and most importantly we can now start this specific tool uh, on uh, the data that we earlier on have uh, found so what is being done now is that the content of the book is being sent to this external services uh, Voyant, which is actually provided by um, computing center in uh, in Canada in this case um, and uh, we see immediately uh, some some basic results from this so for instance the uh, the high frequency terms uh, if we click on specific term like lunacy we can see how often that occurs where in the document and uh, much more information can be uh, found in a, in a similar way uh, similarly we can also perform uh, additional analysis on uh, this file so for instance we could uh, perform a uh, grammatic analysis uh, so-called constituency parsing uh, through one of the other services that are available in Clarin in this case it is this is Weblicht which is uh, made available through our German uh, colleagues um, and this uh, service requires federated login but uh, well, obviously this is uh, quite convenient so uh, this means I can use my account at Utrecht University to actually authenticate to the service and then send the data over to the specific service to have it uh, analyzed um, here we get to see the uh, interface of uh, of Weblicht and we can uh, let the separate stages of this pipeline run and analyze um, the the data um, since this can take a while, I mean it's a comput computationally expensive operation, I will let it run in the background and I will uh, already move forward with the second part of my demonstration and we can have a look at the results when this is uh, finished. Um, and the second part of my present uh, of the demonstration actually starts with um, logging into uh, B2Drop, uh, which is the, uh, yeah, online, uh, desktop, uh, no, the online desktop, the online storage service provided through uh, EUDAT um, and here we have uh, collab again I can use a federated login to authenticate to this uh, service and uh, here we uh, uh, yes uh, there we are um, and here we have collaboratively edited um, one of the files that we have just downloaded from uh, the uh, parliamentary uh, library um, and for instance here uh, you can see indeed the PDF file we've converted that into a text file and done some collaborative uh, editing through this uh, interface as you can see we've basically done some basic steps like removing the title page uh, which is irrelevant for uh, a linguistic analysis now similarly as uh, we did uh, for um, uh, for the PDF we can now also send off the text file 
to uh, the uh, switchboard. So there's also a button here, send to the switchboard. And uh, again, analysis automatically uh, proves that the this is an English text file and then automatically gives an overview of the tasks that we can perform based on this uh, input file. Now, in this case, we could say we're interested in dependency parsing, which is a different way of grammatical analysis of, uh, of the file. Uh, and we can start, uh, for instance, the, the UDPipe tool provided by our colleagues in uh, Prague. Um, and here we see indeed that the text has been submitted and analysis uh, is made and you can get access uh, to the output in different ways. So you can have a look at the tables or you can also see, uh, for instance, uh, the, uh, uh, the tree structure that is behind this uh, grammatical analysis. Uh, you can click on a specific uh, term, uh, say uh, law or lunacy, and you can see where in the, in the results this is uh, to be found. Um, okay, so um, this gives a kind of quick illustration of how the data can actually be made uh, actionable. Uh, let me also have a look at the outcomes of uh, Weblicht. So uh, here, and I'll switch to a bit of a more relevant sentence uh, because we first had to get, uh, for instance, here, uh, we can see uh, that uh, the analysis has also been made. Uh, again, we have access to the data in several ways. So either tabular or in a tree structure, we can zoom into it to understand a bit better uh, what is where. Um, Again, this is something that you then can later on uh, analyze. Uh, we don't have the time for that today, but it gives an idea of how uh, the switchboard and the connected tools uh, make it possible um, basically uh, to, um, yeah, to analyze uh, the data and to, to make the data really uh, actionable that is available. Um, okay, so let me switch back to the presentation. Um, as said, um, there are further steps that can be taken here. I mean, I'm not claiming today that this is the full research uh, process, but it's a kind of an illustration. And obviously then based on the further uh, analysis that has been made, you could make a publication. Uh, you could again uh, have references to the relevant data sets or the outcome of the uh, group uh, analysis that has been uh, made and make a, a registration of that through a virtual collection or for instance, in uh, one of the repositories like uh, B2Share or a combination, you could have a virtual collection pointing to data in B2Share, etc. Good, uh, bringing me to the end of the presentation, coming back to the uh, impact. Um, so uh, what have we been doing? Uh, Claren has integrated three specific thematic services with uh, one another. Uh, secondly, also with uh, several of the uh, EOS Cup uh, services, or the infrastructure services, B2Drop and B2Share more specifically. Um, and then at the uh, next step, we also integrated this with neighboring humanities and social sciences data sets. So for instance, through Europeana and services, think of Wyon, but also many more that are uh, still in the pipeline. Uh, and I think very important here to realize is the fact that this high level of integration strengthens the multiplicator effect for data and for services. Uh, I haven't even mentioned the concept of fair data here, but it's very obvious that if you have fair data as demonstrated here, uh, it makes it much easier to find it, to uh, achieve interoperability, uh, for instance, through the switchboard to, uh, uh, to, to, to increase reusability. Um, so, so that goes uh, without saying. And in the end, and that's I think the most important impact of um, of the whole exercise is the fact that you can process more data with more language uh, analysis tools, leading to uh, easier research process, less uh, loss of time for researchers, and also this whole network effect. So you're basically connecting all the data sets with all the tools. And I think this is um, yeah, a very uh, important achievement and also something that could help to make clear why uh, this hub functionality of EOS Hub is so uh, important. Um, that brings me to the, the uh, end of the presentation. If you're curious and want to learn more about specific examples given, have a look at these URLs. And uh, otherwise, I'm uh, happy to take uh, some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dieter. So uh, we are behind schedule, as, as always, uh, in this kind of session. So I would start with a couple of questions, uh, just a couple of questions that have been made in the chat, for, which are for all presenters. So the first one is from Sean, um, who asked uh, if you uh, 
uh, were not part of EOSCAD project, would you still have integrated these services into EOS and why? So what benefit do you get from integration to EOS services? Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to start first, Victor, as you... Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, I think um, we would probably have uh, connected uh, some of the, of the services, but probably a bit more uh, loosely. Um, so, for instance, one of the uh, more tighter integration parts that we have done here, and that was not uh, literally mentioned in, in, in my presentation is the fact that we are using some of the computational resources that were made available through EOS Cup uh, for, for instance, running the component registry and some of those backend services that we are providing or some of the services like virtual language observatory uh, in its uh, several uh, development stages are running through uh, EOS Cup provided uh, uh, computing resources. Uh, I think uh, probably we would have uh, had less attention for the policy side and this is also something where uh, the, the, the active participation in EOS Cup really has helped us a lot in terms of understanding uh, concepts like for instance virtual access and all the reporting that comes with that. Uh, as bureaucratic as it might be it's a, a useful lesson to understand how these concepts are uh, put into practice. And uh, for instance, also uh, the policy framework, uh, for instance, like FITSM, where several of our people have uh, followed one of the courses. And it really helps a lot in terms of understanding how to professionally uh, run a service and how to achieve high levels of, uh, yeah, uh, in the end, uh, user satisfaction for your, for your services. And I think that helped a lot. Um, besides that, I think also there were some uh, non-foreseen uh, interactions with uh, EOS Cup, like for instance, uh, our activities in uh, the Reprolang uh, track, where it was a kind of um, uh, workshop where people reproduced uh, uh, results uh, based on natural language processing, which required lots of computational resources to be rerun at short notice. And there too, we were very happy to have this kind of uh, connection to uh, EOS Cup and the eInfra partners to be able to run uh, certain uh, of these experiments. And, and this worked out very well. And I think that without being part of EOS Cup, this probably would have been a lot more difficult for us. So I think um, there was really a lot of added value in uh, uh, yeah, active participation in uh, EOS Cup. Thanks, Peter. Any other comment from Daniela or Fabrizio on this question? Yes, I'm not sure to understood the, well the question, but I think uh, um, I see a great value related to the opportunity of having a rich scientific environment to perform the experiment for research without, uh, for example, download data and visualize the results on the at client side. I don't know if the uh, I think shown, it was more um... if shown mean that. Uh, w would you have been doing the same uh, level of integration uh, without the EOSCAP project? That was, I think, more uh, Sean point. Sorry, Sorry Debra, I, I don't understand the question. So the point was, uh, would you have done the same level of integration and um, provisioning of, for your thematic service without the EOSCAP project? Let's suppose the EOSCAP project would never exist. Uh, would you uh, have envisaged the same type of integration uh, with other services as the one you have shown uh, in, your, in your presentation that has been achieved during the project? I, I may comment for Dodas if you want. Yeah, it's, yeah please. It's very quick. <clears throat> so I, um, I shared part of the uh, previous comments and the previous answer. So uh, probably not at the same level, uh, at least for uh, the technical stuff, of course, for the integration of services uh, being part of the project uh, has been helpful in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, uh, making a lot of synergy uh, and so on. So uh, I, uh, as previous commented in my during my the answer to my after my talk, uh, I think there is also the uh, the part related to the uh, exploitation of this dissemination program of 
Bios Cub that is really stimulating uh, and helpful, uh, uh, which gave us uh, a lot of fruits. Uh, I don't know if this will uh, would be happened uh, without Eos Cub. So I would uh, distinguish the, the, the question between uh, technical staff and non-technical uh, uh, activities. Uh, from the technical perspective, of course, uh, not at the same level, but surely um, uh, from the non-technical part, uh, I think uh, uh, we would uh, not reach uh, the, the, very same, uh, the very same level of uh, uh, matu maturity and activity. Also in terms of uh, uh, preparing training programs uh, and sharing with communities at that level. I think uh, that was uh, uh, a push uh, that we get from, uh, uh, from, uh, from the project. Thank so I think, yeah, I, think, I think it's clear from those two answers that if EOS Cub still existed but you weren't part of the project, you would still be integrating your services into EOSC, but it would be more difficult because you wouldn't have the close involvement. Is that a fair summary? To some extent, that's, that may be correct. And uh, I mean, uh, uh, if you want, uh, we can restate even more saying that uh, the vision is completely shared. So the, the vision of the project with the, between uh, and the vision of my uh, thematic service is surely um, well uh, aligned so uh, we are not uh, in that in that respect uh, that there is a uh, there is the possibility to to contribute uh, in, to contribute in any case uh, without EOS Cub, uh, it's uh, even uh, uh, too hard to say what would have uh, happened so i don't know if you see what i mean it's uh, it's not uh, so trivial to say okay so in principle yes you are right but then the reality is uh, there's a lot of uh, implication so we are, we are talking because we have had uh, almost three years of uh, intense activity of uh, such a big process, project. So it's not... Uh... Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I think we are very late. Uh, Rob, shall we, shall we close here? I know there were another couple of questions, but uh, I think we are, uh, we are demanded <laughs> to, to close. Um, yeah, um, I'm not sure. Um, we can close if you, if you are okay with closing now. Um, perhaps uh, you can collect the, the further questions from the chat and then maybe address. Yeah, them. I have already copied it from from the chat, so uh, I may be forwarding to the speakers so they can answer offline. Um, okay. Do, 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 do. Sorry, but yeah, I know the staff has to get ready for the next section. So uh, we, unfortunately, we cannot go uh, too long with that. So uh, I'd like to, to close uh, thanking all the speakers for sharing their experience today in this session. It is uh, very important and it was very interesting. Um, and um, hope to see you all soon into uh, a next uh, event. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Bye. Bye.